I'm Maggie, if you haven't met me. Hello, welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming on such a horrible hot day. Um, our speaker today is Harriet Goodall. Please welcome Harriet. Hello. <laughs> and Harriet's daughter is here too, Clementine, who came. <laughs> and Harriet will be talking to us about all sorts of fibery things. I don't think I can summarise them, so I'll just leave it to you to talk. So I'll pass on to you now, Harriet, and we look forward to hearing everything you've got to say however you want to say it, whether you want to take questions or have breaks. All over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Hello. <clears throat> I think we will have a break maybe halfway because it is pretty uncomfortable in the heat. I know um, Clementine and I have driven from the Southern Highlands where it's generally about 20 degrees cooler than um, Sydney, so we'll definitely be feeling it. Um, and I might, I've asked her to give me a half-time wave and um, let you stretch your legs and have a walk around. Um, however, if, if it's too much, too long, whatever, feel free to give me the, the chop because I understand. Okay, so first of all, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wongo people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, um, which is particularly pertinent today. Um, uh, and um, just a warning that this presentation contains images of Aboriginal people who have passed away. So thank you to Margie Sathios for the invitation and to the Guild for inviting me here to speak. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, so thank you. Um, and I'm sure in this room there is vast experience of the ins and outs of weaving, mostly 2D, I imagine. Um, I'm a 3D weaver. Um, but I'm not actually going to compare the techniques and joys of each, so we don't need to feel our differences. Um, I am uh, going to show you how my passion for travel and textiles led me to work with Indigenous communities um, around the world and how my deep love of landscape has um, ended up with me being a full-time fibre artist and maker and basketry teacher. Um, so I did watch some of the uh, YouTube um, films that you had um, done, put up very, very cleverly um, and was mightily impressed by, by, by Alberto, mightily impressed by Alberto and, um, and particularly related to the work of Margaret Grafton. Some of you may have been here, I think it was earlier last year. Um, just in in that she was raising children um, and supporting a young family through commissions of tapestry. Um, and I am yet to reach the heights of her success, but I do need to make it a financial concern because I don't have any other work. Um, and uh, we live on a farm. We have animals and veggies, and that's pretty much it. So um, I also have an interest in feminism and the tools of craft to empower women. And I've been lucky enough to witness this in action um, in several countries. So that's um, what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a little background um, of, of my early years, just to anchor you in the story. And then I'll conclude with um, some of my recent work, work which I think is what um, brought me to Maggie's attention, um, a recent exhibition that I had. But that'll be just briefly at the beginning and briefly at the end. Um, because I think talking entirely about myself and my work for an hour would be excruciating for both parties. We'll tour briefly through Indigenous social enterprise in Pitamarca, Peru, which some of you may have already witnessed firsthand, being lovers of spinning and weaving. Um, put up your hand if you've been to Peru and seen any of the weaving there. Oh, fantastic. That's great. I thought I might bore you all senseless if, you're, if you've been there, you love dyeing and, and weaving. So that's good. Um, so we'll have a little virtual tour through there and Catherine in the Northern Territory, Apia, Samoa, and Wiradjuri country, New South Wales. I'll try to keep it within the time limits, um, but in light of the recent bushfires and school holidays, um, I haven't had as much time to practice, so if I digress, I'm sorry. And as I said before, please feel free to cut me off, Maggie. Um, I've brought a table of samples to look at, and my lovely assistant, Clementine Campbell, will be here to help pass them around if you would like to sing out and say, um, pass me that, please. So, <clears throat> uh, I was a daughter of drought and bushfire and hailstorms um, uh, in the 80s. I grew up um, on a country property at Young. My father was a sheep farmer. 
it's all starting to make sense already. Um, and I soaked up the drama and delight of the Australian rural landscape and its colours, the harsh lines. This is actually the property that I grew up on at its worst um, in about 1983. But I spent hours in the truck with Dad burning off, which is what you, you do after a, a crop has been harvested, um, burning the stubble and the lines and marks and smells um, of the bush really um, stayed with me more than the, the privilege of the lifestyle. I really love the crackle and the harshness. Um, and um, my HSC artwork was actually a pentactic five paintings um, called Bushfire Aftermath, um, which had bits of burnt charred bone and paintings of dead sheep and uh, really exploring what it was like to be in, on a place after a fire. And I had no idea how prescient that would be for current times. Um, so my visual language has pretty much always been one of um, decay and the marks that are left um, with age and time. Um, the Shearing Shed played part in my childhood as uh, fibre lovers and spinners. I thought that was important to mention that the smell of the lanolin and the rest um, was something that I, I, that I adore and always will. And also the shed, the architecture of, of country life, that corrugated iron and the way that the, the buildings are all um, put together. Um, that's me at about the same age as Clem is now um, on the front lawn. You can probably only just see me here um, in 1983 um, and I'm tiny compared to the huge dust storm that's rolling in on our, to our, towards our house um, from the west. Uh, and yeah, we kept a little album of all the drama, you know, the hailstorms and, the, and these sorts of things because they really were what life was about. It was that slight fear and frisson of living somewhere where these things really made an impact. Um, so yeah. My aunt, Gail English, was a full-time artist and paved the way for me to consider a, life, a creative life. And I think a lot of people don't have that perhaps growing up. Probably all of you had creative mothers and sisters and women in your lives. But a lot of people who come to my weaving classes say, oh, I'm not creative. Um, and perhaps they've never been shown that it's okay to have a go. I was lucky enough to have um, a abstract colourist painter um, in my family who drew inspiration from the country that I loved and I grew up going to her exhibition openings and serving wine and so art was part of, um, part of life for us um, and these are just some of her works. This is from a recent dust storm series um, of which we have a big one in our house. So you can see how the colours um, play into that visual language. So. That's just a bit about pre-adult life. As an adult, I fell in love with travel. Um, I went to university uh, and then basically worked to travel and in my 20s, um, traveled through you know, 25 countries. The last part of that was with my current husband, um, or my only husband, <laughs> but uh, he was my boyfriend at the time and we, we saved up working and um, traveled for 10 months across the world um, and finished in South America. As we travelled, we were drawn to textiles as something that was beautiful and easy to put in a backpack. Um, so we found ourselves taking uh, textiles other than, rather than any other kind of souvenir, although at the time I had no weaving experience or real understanding of their, their true beauty. Um, but uh, I brought one example of a piece that we um, traded in India. And I was conscious also very much living with families that these were important heirlooms and relics and things that had taken a long time to make. Um, this one was sitting on a roof under a pile of animal feed, sort of a bit of it poking out and um, I pulled it out and um, it was from a place called Mud in the Himalaya um, up in the mountains. Matt and I were riding a motorcycle um, for six weeks and staying in sort of family guest houses and I was hesitant to sort of pull it out of the pile where it was, but I could see that it wasn't getting any love. And, um, and uh, we collected this piece, and it's a real treasure for me. I absolutely love it, um, despite some of the things I know about the colours now. So I just brought that along to show you. This is part of the education pile. Um, so 
we became aware of the fact that in the Andes, a lot of the old textiles were being taken from families and sold in tourist markets in huge, great heaping piles. And these are incredible, beautiful pieces. I've got goosebumps thinking about it. Um, unfortunately, they were being replaced with knockoff Chinese blankets, made, made in China blankets with pictures of tigers on them, that were cheap and easy to access. So these things that would take months to make, as you would know, um, were really being harvested for money. Um, and they're heirlooms, and we felt sad about that. And what we saw um, as we travelled were this is a good example of the old and the new. Um, we saw the beautiful traditional colours that were naturally dyed and hand spun. And with comparison to the fluorescent aniline market bought colours, which are obviously a lot faster and easier to make. And we wondered what was going to happen and if anyone was sort of um, doing anything of quality um, because there seemed to be a lot of poverty in the weaving conditions and a lot of things that look like this in the markets, um, which, you know, I'm sure you can see um, that it's uh, machine thread and, and unnatural dye. So um, I don't think we really planned specifically to, to, to start something ourselves, but we came across this chap um, called Timoteo Carita Sakaka in the markets in Cusco, um, who we ended up working with for about 15 years. Um, and he's a, a heavenly man. He was the, the mayor of his region. And we just got chatting to him one evening. Um, and we ended up falling in love with the work that he had around him, which was all naturally dyed and all new, which might sound counterintuitive to someone who's traveling, looking at old textiles in another country, but to see quality things being made um, was just so uplifting and they were so beautiful. Um, and so we spent hours chatting with him and I, I've just looked through all the photos and they were, we were there looking, talking, talking, taking lots of photos of all his work. Um, but these are warp faced, um, discontinuous warp um, weavings all using um, colours that were made um, from plant um, and botanical dyes. So he invited us, it was really lucky, the next morning he was heading off to his valley and um, so we found ourselves up at five o'clock in the morning on a bumpy truck to a place called Pitumarca, which is about two hours south of Cusco um, in the lowest village. And um, it was just very fortunate he was going off to do a dying day and we had enough Spanish to understand that and, um, and off we headed into the mountains. We, we were, uh, I just put a, a map up here uh, for those who have been to Peru. Cusco's up here, Bolivia, this is Lake Titicaca here and this red mark is Pitumarca. Um, this is the line you can see here where the Andes falls away to the Amazon jungle. So it's quite a wild country. Um, and Pitumarca here is in the shadow of a mountain called Alsangate. And um, Peru is a very religious culture, um, very Catholic, and there are cathedrals in every town, um, but they also revere their traditional gods. And one of the most revered is Apu Alsangate. So he features a lot in the iconography and symbology in the weaving. And the valley that Timoteo is from is here in the mountains, Pitumarca, this valley. And you can see the snow just at the top there, um, which is the beginning of Alsangate Mountain. So their, their association, their weaving association, was the Valle de Tejedoras de Alsangate. So it's all about the mountain of Alsangate. So off we went, um, not really knowing what we were doing or where we were going. And we were brought to the locale or community building. And they didn't know we were coming. So they had an inkling, they, they must have known that Timoteo was coming that day and they were there ready with their mantas. I'm not sure if you can see here, they have the mantas, which are the shawls they wear, and inside those are the looms wrapped up to continue weaving for the day. Um, there's a bottle of something here, which we'll, refer, we'll see in a bit what that was for. Um, so this is the entrance to the community building, much like we are today. They were there waiting for their, um, their day together. And um, this was the condition of the buildings. So fairly rugged um, and run down um, with some falling apart looking thatching um, and I'll, I'm referring to that particularly because of what happens in the future. Um, 
there's an old woman asleep. Is there anyone old woman asleep? Oh, maybe. So um, these were the schoolrooms um, as well. So they were a group of buildings that were used for weaving, but also schoolrooms. Um, and in this area, the majority of people speak Quechua. So not Spanish and certainly not English. So I had enough Spanish to um, communicate a little uh, enough and um, then that would be translated to the women, translated back to me and I would t then tell Matt. Um, so quite a, quite a lot of communicating going on. Here we have um, alpaca, lana being, um, being cleaned, ready for spinning. Um, and you can see already the beautiful costumery of the, of the people um, and the natural colours of the fleece which was incorporated into the weavings. Drop spindles, which I know some of you are, I can see little smiles, which is nice to a bit of recognition as these things happen. You know the, the agonies and ecstasies of these things. Um, and another drop spindle with the wool spine. You can see how fine the, the spinning is there and that's what they're going to use in their weaving. Um, so the white fleece was used for dyeing. Here's, I am learning to skein up um, uh, some wool. You'll know more than me about a lot of this because I didn't become a textile weaver, I became a basket maker. Um, but it was, it was fascinating for us to be included and to be shown and it was literally just Matt and I there um, on this day with the women in the community building. So, and then the wool was washed, mordanted, ready for dyeing. So it's all going on, all at the same time, all the different stages of weaving, dyeing and spinning. Here's a loom, um, a backstrap loom set up. You can see the stakes going into the ground and the bits of alpaca rope um, tying it up. Um, and there were little inkle looms being, being started for straps and um, smaller pieces. And then we were shown how to warp up, which um, was actually a lovely social process because it can take hours to decide which colours the women are going to use because they're warp faced textiles and the patterns actually come out from the, the colours of, of warp that is chosen whereas my friend the tapestry weaver showed me how to use the, the weft to make the patterns um, and the colours so this process is quite important and can take hours and throwing the balls back and forth on the loom is really fun so we sat at one end and the ball was thrown wrapped around the estate loom and sent back to the other end um, you can see the children looking on and the backstrap loom in process and here um, a close-up of the, the threads being picked for the design and the beautiful sharpened bones that they use um, to, to pick up um, their warps. Um, so it was a, a, a very uh, much a community feeling with lots of children and lots of babies everywhere wrapped up in, you know, and they're all wearing everything they've made and all their textiles are wrapped around them. So it was really beautiful and, um, and such a privilege to be there and see all this. I might have been a little bit clucky at this stage um, at the number of baby photos that I was taking. Um, but there were children, um, children and babies everywhere looking on with curiosity. Um, the thing that really captured our imagination, I don't know, um, I think the weaving perhaps at that point felt a little just beyond anything I could even come at, but the dyeing um, was just magic. Um, having never really um, been a dyer or seen natural dyeing before, the process was so, um, so sort of obvious and in front of us. So this is the cochineal, which is um, Dactylopius coccus. It's a scale insect parasite. Some of you will have dyed with it before. If you're, um, if you're into dyeing, you'll know about it, but it's um, brushed off the prickly pear. And it was considered by the Spanish one of the wonders of the New World and um, exported by the ton or shipped back to Spain, hence all the red coats and those sort of army uniforms with all their bright reds. Um, and it's still actually, Peru is still actually the largest exporter of cochineal. So the little, the little bodies are crushed up, having been dried and then added to the water to make those brilliant reds of their jackets. Um, here we're picking chilca which is a green leaf found in sort of plentiful amounts all on the hills. You can see they must have spent time um, collecting the branches of that previously. I'm trying to look useful by picking leaves. Um, and that is then put into the pot to make this beautiful green colour. So um, the process is, is so simple and magic, um, just boiling up the leaves, as, as some of you would know, with the, with the wool. Often with a mordant, some kind of mineral mordant. Um, so here we are picking the leaves out, me looking rather large. 
Um, and another dye here is a, a this is kaka sulka, which is a lichen. Um, and it makes a lovely orange. And then the kole, which is a yellow flower. And then the pots are put inside. This is typical of a Peruvian kitchen. In the people's houses, they have fires in the corner, often with um, guinea pig running out of little holes on the side and eating the scraps and leftovers on the kitchen floor. Um, and the pots are just put over the fire like that and boiled up. So here we have the yellow coming out. This is the bottle that I was um, referring to before. So for the dyers in the room, does anyone have an inkling of what this might be? It is, <laughs> yes. Um, so that was kind of a shock <laughs> when that was poured out. That's little boy's urine for the newbie. Um, fermented for the cold dye process of indigo and little boy urine used because it was pure and free of alcohol. And probably easy to get in a bottle, to be honest. Um, so uh, here we have Timoteo adding their indigo powder. The indigo grows at lower elevations. Um, Pichamarca is um, at 3,570 metres, so quite high. So um, indigo grows below 1,500, so it's something that they have to buy in, in the markets. Um, and <coughs> Timoteo, part of his role as a master dyer and weaver is to come up and make sure the women have what they need to make the weavings for their association because they don't travel down to Cusco. So this is purple awaipili, which is a quite difficult to find plant in this area. I know that it doesn't grow in the Sacred Valley, which is not too far away, but it makes a glorious purple. So I think the women probably felt quite special about having awaipili um, there to die with. And that's Saul, who's Timoteo's son. Um, checking the colour and then hanging the beautiful colours out. So the other part of the project is knitting, which I've seen some of you here making something circular looking already today. You will again know a lot more about knitting than me. I break needles, not a good knitter. Um, but obviously um, transfixed, transfixed by the beauty of the, um, the chulios, which are the, the little hats that they made. Um, again with the iconography on them, the symbols. Um, uh, in the weaving the symbols are called palai and they can take um, you know, hours and hours to decide which ones they're going to make because they tell stories. Quechua was originally an oral language, so not a written language. So this was a storytelling device. Um, putting the symbols and um, imagery into the weaving would tell things about where the weaver came from and her background um, or her sense of humour. Um, so uh, it was really important to them um, to include their popular designs. Animals feature quite heavily. Um, and just things that are part of the daily lives of the weavers. Um, so the knitting, um, you might think the little uh, bobbles, which are called kurpas, are knitted or are stitched on afterwards, or at least I would as a, a novice. No, 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 they are little balls going around, and then the big skein um, to do the main weaving. Again, I could probably have, you two could come up and tell us more about that. Um, so we were crazy head over heels for this stuff. We just thought it was so beautiful. We didn't have much money left um, in the world, Matt and I. Um, we were in our late 20s, but we decided um, to spend our last, I think it was, I don't know, our first order was about $750 worth of beanies. And you can imagine the reaction of all our family and friends when we'd come home from travelling the world for a year and decided to just spend all our money on beanies. Um, but we came home and we set up a little stall in the markets here in Sydney. And I think we did three markets in a row on the first weekend. Um, this might be Orange Grove markets. We went to Bondi, we did them all. And it was a hit. And we sold so many we could buy some more. And we just kept doing that and doing that and doing that. And in the first two years, we put all our profits aside um, so that we could go back. So we had little stalls at festivals and we had cards and we tried to sort of educate people about the difference between the natural dyes and non-natural. And we, had, we made little handwritten tags um, that all tell that still you can see here the name of the weaver and how long they took to make and um, that they were fair trade. And we didn't bargain. We didn't ask for a discount, a bulk discount or anything. We paid the price that Timoteo was selling them for, for in Cusco. 
So they got pretty good, good deal out of us because we bought hundreds and thousands of beanies over our time. Not hundreds of thousands, but thousands definitely of beanies in the time that we were, we were doing it. We also then began to sell um, beautiful fingerless gloves, which were very popular, which are over there. So after the first two years of this, it also enabled Matt and I to have this wonderful lifestyle of travelling to Sydney and Canberra with our little van and sleeping in the back and meeting people and chatting and going to festivals. And it was just perfect for our start of our life together. So um, we were very, very fortunate um, to do that. There's Matt looking cold at some festival late at night. Um, and then when we were able to go back, we could explain to them what worked and what didn't work for Australian heads and what people like to buy and what, you know, because often we would get a big box full and there'd be a good percentage that we couldn't sell. Um, some of those are here today. Um, uh, so it was a, a product design process, really, um, and a quality control and um, an enabling of information exchange that would help them sell more. So. Um, when we arrived back, there was um, such excitement and joy from all of us after us being there for two years, you know, pushing this story and actually knowing which pieces were made by which incredible women, that when we came back, there was song and there was dance and there were games and there was blindfolds and petals thrown and there was crying <laughs> on both parts. Um, what the women explained to us is that they were having to go and work in the jungle and work for mining companies and leave their families to support their families because they're subsistence farmers and they just couldn't afford to stay at home because their husbands you know were farming and there wasn't enough to, there was no money there was food to eat but no money and so this meant they had money so they used it to feed their children and buy them books and um you know send them to school and they were just so beautiful and happy um, and uh, what was really magic was this building in the background that you can see that in the two years uh, that we'd been buying more and more material they had built a new locale so a new community building the community had got together and um, and they all built it together and you can see the difference it has a tiled roof rather than the old falling off thatching I'm, I'm, I mean I'm going fast but um, hopefully you can see their you know rendered walls, tiled roofs, and something that will last for longer. So, very exciting. Um, I've actually got footage of this clickety-clack, clickety-clack row of women knitting and chatting, which is just marvellous, but I don't have it here. Um, so, again, a big, big dying. At this time, we stayed for six weeks um, in the communities, and um, it was um, just so nice to see everyone so happy and healthy. And the amount of dyeing that was done was comparatively huge <laughs> uh, compared with the last time. And you can see we were there in a very good season. Um, yeah, so there's large amounts of wool. Mm. So again, the cochineal, but just en masse. Um, I couldn't, I had to put that one in. Sweet little donkey. Um, so. It was, um, it was a really lovely thing to go back and to work on, on pieces that um, we knew we could sell and to see the young girls involved in the project and to see this intergenerational learning. And in a lot of the Indigenous communities that, that I've worked with, that has been one of the most important things or gratifying things um, is that the older women and the younger women are able to work together and that knowledge is being passed on and passed down rather than being lost. Um, that's our lunch, which um, is known as Koi, um, Clementine Lookaway, owner of many guinea pigs. Um, I, I often said we ate a lot of guinea pig to get where we are because <laughs> it's actually a great treat for the women to, to cook this food for us. And in this picture, um, I was, we were seated at the front of a hall and much like looking at all of you, the women of the community were sitting all around the room watching us eat <laughs> and not eating themselves. It was a, a real treat, it's a birthday food. Um, or a Christmas food and so we were most completely unable to um, to say no and I might look happy there but I'm absolutely petrified of what's in front of me um, but uh, yeah cultural cultural learning cultural learning um, and then uh, we had rehydrated dehydrated potatoes often um, these are a bit of a staple up in the higher villages in the valley so we went to seven or so different villages um, 
So yeah, not all fun and games, a little bit of kind of taking deep breaths and smiling when we were feeling a bit overwhelmed and not very comfortable sometimes, the walking and the accommodation, um, but uh, an honour nonetheless. Down in Cusco, we also decided we needed a product that would sell um, at a higher price point and possibly in summer because we were finding in summer markets quite difficult to sell the beanies. So um, we found a community that worked with, um, we, again with the Tepete Largos, with the weaving, and they had some plain striped fabrics that we thought would work well because it's not always easy to sell uh, something with a lot of um, traditional looking, ethnic looking patterning on it in, in Australia when someone's not on holiday and it's, it's something that people might buy when they visit Cusco. So these were um, sort of what we started with as, as bags and then we decided to make something a bit more contemporary and we designed these plain um, bags. I don't know if any of you came across us in the markets um, but I still see these around on the streets and I, there's one of our bags and we sold hundreds of these at the time. Um, and we just asked them to take out all the palai and keep the just plain stripes, still using the natural dyeing, still using the skills, but, um, but just so much easier to, to sell to a contemporary audience. And we looked at the plastic market bags they were using, um, going to their markets and used that shape as a model. So, half time? Okay, thank you. Um, so, essentially, Matt and I Bought material. Unfortunately, we conceived in 2007 on our this trip back to Peru. Fortunately or unfortunately, not this child, but the uh, the first child, and that ended our travels. You know, um, we kept going to markets um, as much as we could uh, and took the children, but um, we weren't able to to fling across to South America very easily with babies in tow. So we kept selling um, products under the banner Walk and Weft for about 15 years, as I said, um, until it became untenable for us to actually do that with full-time jobs and kids at school and markets on the weekend. So um, we sort of slowly petered out our um, contribution, but hopefully I feel like the legacy of that project was a really good um, upskilling and upscaling of the projects in Pichamarca. And when we looked at the map um, preparing this presentation, we went, oh, there's a restaurant. So um, we think things must, have, um, must be, have become more feasible for tourists to go in, and visit in, in Timoteo's village since we stopped a few years ago. So um, we'll stop for a little break in a minute. Um, I'll just whiz you through, meanwhile, at home, um, I had start, set up my own studio um, and begun weaving uh, baskets and lights. These were the first lights that I made. Um, I was teaching a lot of random weaving uh, using natural and harvested materials. Um, and I started with this little studio in a dairy um, on the farm. And Clementine was a baby. I had a um, baby monitor and I would weave until I heard the squawking in the monitor and that was when I wove and when she was asleep. It was actually very productive, I have to say. She was a good sleeper. So, um, so I got a lot of weaving done and I began um, making lights and exhibiting a little bit. I moved into a studio in town after a couple of years. I think I had about four or five years in that little dairy with no water and no electricity. Moved into a little space in Robertson with a friend um, who was a tapestry weaver. She was a beginner too, studying at Sturt. And, um, and we shared this space and just filled it with all our craziness for a couple of years. Um, and then this was inside the studio. I began playing with um, fibre sculpture and using the agricultural offcasts of my youth, um, using it as an excuse to go back to that farm uh, origin. Um, I exhibited at Golden Regional Art Gallery. This was a piece about um, trees communicating or plants communicating under the ground. Um, and playing with lots of different fibres. I moved into metal work. I was commissioned to make a series of different bovine sculptures. Um, uh, this was a full-size steer that went to a commercial job. But I incorporated bits of weaving. I don't know if you can see them in these. But there are bits of fibre and little bits of looping and parts of my basketry included through all these recycled materials. So um, strange things were afoot at home. 
meanwhile. And then I moved into a studio in Moss Vale, which was a, a shop front, um, purely because our lease ran out in Robertson and we needed somewhere. So Natalie and I moved. Um, Natalie Miller, you might be aware of her. We shared the studio for five years. Um, and I ran workshops in the space and it was good, but it was on the street. So I didn't get a lot of work done because people would come in and chat. Um, so I then, um, this is just some other work, some of my work here. I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I'm not really planning to talk about how I make and what I make, but you can come and talk to me afterwards if you're interested in basketry. I'm happy to talk you through um, that. And you can come along to a workshop and I can teach you technique there. Um, I travelled overseas and taught at um, different retreats. I went to Squam Art Workshops, highly recommend. Most amazing art workshops in New Hampshire in America um, with multidisciplinary, lots of knitters, lots of yarn work, um, photography, writing, um, illustration, all sorts of wonderful artists in one place over um, a, a period of three or four days. And I did that three times. I took retreats in Bali and Vietnam and Japan, organised by Natalie. Um, I've been very lucky to have some very creative opportunities. Um, and so we've taken groups of women, much like yourselves, um, to places where they have a textile tradition and have a really fabulous holiday and lots of delicious food and run workshops while we're there. So um, kept making, and this, this is my current studio. So I was in here, I always had a sort of welding kind of shared space while I was doing these things. Um, this is about 100 metres from the house and about 20 metres from the kids' bus stop. So this is a space that I work in which no one comes to. So I can um, be as, um, you know, I can podcast and make my work and, um, and be as, as much of a hermit as I like, um, which is just fab. So that's, um, that's where I'm working now. Let's have a break and then I'll just run you through the other projects that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so that was a, a, a long project that we were involved with over many years and I just want to talk now a bit more briefly about two other short projects um, that I have been privileged enough to facilitate. Um, I, as I said, was making my own work, so getting a bit of a, um, a name uh, in, um, I guess, in a fairly small demographic. Um, for my work and was, was approached by, um, uh, and, and nearly every, every opportunity I've had has sort of, I've been really lucky just to be able to say yes to things rather than to have to kind of put myself out there. Um, but you do have to be fairly brave to say yes to some things. Um, this was one that I felt really nervous about because I had no experience um, of working with Aboriginal people at this stage and I knew that they would be vastly different culturally um, and linguistically to myself and my own background. Um, I was approached by the arts coordinator of an organisation called Jilpin Arts um, at Catherine. Um, it's an organisation uh, established for the benefit of the Beswick community which is um, in the top end of the Northern Territory. Um, so they are based in Beswick, Wugula, on the traditional land of the Jawoin people. Um, on the website they say it was established in 2002 to maintain, develop and promote local traditional and contemporary Aboriginal visual and performing arts, working in country with kin and culture across generations, their activities bringing healing to the community, and link traditional culture with modern enterprise. Sounds a lot like Peru, the project that we were working in. Social enterprise, bringing culture across generations to benefit um, people financially and self-esteem. So um, I felt I had some experience in that area and um, I was invited by Carmen Chapel, who was the arts coordinator and I flew to Darwin 
drove three hours to Catherine, um, and then spent five days harvesting, preparing, and dyeing pandanus, which is the um, main fibre used in that community or in that area, um, and, um, and then helping the women with some design ideas. They can all weave beautifully, so I wasn't there to teach weaving. Um, I was there to bring a contemporary perspective, much as we were doing in Peru, to what might interest a, a different audience, a Sydney audience or a Melbourne audience, or some of the tourists who travel through. So the community have a gallery in Catherine where they sell incredible wall mats and weavings and fibre sculpture and painting. This is pandanus that's been bush dyed. Pandanus is a palm-like plant um, that is, I might come back to that man in a moment, um, a palm-like plant that is um, native to the tropical and subtropical regions in the Pacific. Um, and there are 750 subspecies of pandanus. So these, uh, so I, I, I went on to work with other pandanus in other places, but this is the pandanus from the territory. Um, Jilpin Arts was started by this man, Tom E. Lewis, who uh, actually passed away last year. Um, he has a whole fascinating story which he told me on the return car journey from Catherine back to Darwin. And it was one of the most um, moving experiences of my life because I came to this project with a lot of guilt. As a white woman growing up in Australia, I felt unworthy and I felt bad about um, my history. And um, Tommy was uh, the son of a German man um, and an Aboriginal mother. His father um, disowned him and sent him to live in the communities. Um, and I think he might have supported him financially, but sent him off. And when Tommy was um, 17, he was discovered in an airport. Um, he was going to do a mechanics course in Darwin and he was discovered by the wife of Fred Skepsy, the film director who said, my husband would like you to star in this film we're making. Um, and he went on to have a really successful film career and play music all around the world. Um, so that's a really short story of Tommy's life. But if he were to tell it to you, as he did to me, it was just really engaging and delightful and fascinating. Um, and he went back to his birthplace after traveling the world and playing jazz and starring in films. And started this organisation, Jilpin Arts, with his wife, Fleur Parry, um, to help the women that had raised him and the communities that he had belonged to. So, um, so I found myself in another bumpy car, heading out to country each day um, with a group of laughing women and harvesting and stripping and preparing pandanus very difficult. So I, I considered myself a basket weaver by this stage. This is 2014, I think. So I'd been weaving for, you know, seven years or so, eight years, and I thought that I was able to weave until I came across stripping pandanus. Um, and much to the amusement of the women, it was just, you know, hours and hours of trying and failing, trying and failing, a bit like using a drop spindle for the first time. Um, lots of breaking and, um, and uh, it's just tough work and 35 degree heat. We think it's hot here today, it's nothing. Humidity, sitting on a, um, on a tarp on the ground, bare bottom bones. Um, and some of these women were sort of 70 odd, 70 plus and um, all smoked like chimneys and um, you know, had very interesting and sad stories to share. Um, I won't share them with you out of respect, but um, there's a lot of trauma and sadness and sorry business um, up there. Uh, so these projects are super important in healing. Um, so you can see the pandanus here on the ground that's been stripped. And they strip it, strip the leaves into little pieces and let them dry in the sun. And then making a fire, involving the children. This is Dora and Dexter and Mel, and they're making a fire. 
And Mel was about a little bit younger than me at the time, and then the children were there because their mothers were on the drink. So they were there with their grandmothers. That's Dexter, he was very naughty. <coughs> um, again, the camp feeling, community, laughing, chatting, being together, um, working and um, uh, storytelling while the work goes on, which I'm sure you can relate to. Um, while we were waiting for the, I'll go through the colour first. Um, this is a bag of root that's been dug up. That's a whole other day of work that happened before I got up there. Um, and then the, the skin of the, the roots are taken off with rocks. These are berries that are being chopped up. I never actually got the, um, the names, the plant species of these, um, of these materials because they called them yellow colour and purple colour, so, or red colour. So um, the yellow colour, they um, strip the bark off and then um, uh, put the, the, much like the last project I looked at, put it in the water, boil it up and then check the colour as the pandanus comes out. And you can see these glorious shades and then put in the sun to dry. While um, that was happening, I introduced them to a little bit of fun random weaving just for something to do while we're waiting for the colours to come. And um, you can see here someone's having a look at a magazine that I brought. There's a bit of language barrier again. I was on my own um, and I was left there for the day with the women. The arts coordinator left. And I was prepared by a friend at home who said to me, you're going to feel really uncomfortable with the communication. I'm really comfortable right now standing up here with my microphone chatting to you all like a teacher and this is what I do in my workshops and everybody nods and looks right at me. I mean, I can see so much eye contact right now. It's quite beautiful. Um, my friend who has Aboriginal heritage, she said to me, you're not going to get the eye contact and you're not going to get the answers to the questions. So you can ask a question and you just have to not take it personally if no one answers because they will not answer you unless they are sure they have something of value to say, which is different to our culture. So we all just say, fill the silence with whatever comes into our head. So it's, it, it takes a bit of getting used to and there are moments where I felt really insecure and um, didn't know if I could break the ice and it took about two days of sitting there with the women for them to really embrace me and not physically but just a, just a feeling that they got me and I got them and to look me in the eye occasionally and have a laugh but yeah it was, it was there's a lot of mistrust and rightly so rightly so of what I represent so I would say would anyone like to do this and there'd be no thing nothing nobody say yes um, you know, you were all very sweet and leapt up here and had a look at my things before, but that wouldn't happen. So they'd be sitting back and I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just start making something. So I just started making something and then someone would quietly just shuffle over and sit next to me and just watch what I was doing and go, hmm, and then shuffle away. And then sometime later they'd come back with an exactly perfectly, <laughs> incredibly made thing. Um, that I probably couldn't have taught them in words anyway, you know. Um, so it's that traditional indigenous model of learning that goes on between generations of watching and viewing and um, learning lap, like sideways lateral learning rather than this, you know, teacher down model. So we had a look through some Vogue livings and bells um, because we were going to make some lighting. Uh, I was invited up there because I made lights and they wanted to sell some lights in the gallery. So I introduced some of this contemporary weaving and then the, um, the colours were finished and I brought along some electrical components and we just sort of had a play and an experiment with some of the traditional techniques that I knew and that they knew and some of the materials that I brought and they just were off and racing. So we were on about day three and it was a five day project so we didn't have a lot of time. Um, so 
Uh, you can see here, anyone who's done basketry, this is a, the one most people are familiar with, uh, which is coiling, where a bundle of material is stitched in a buttonhole stitch going around in a circular motion. Um, uh, again, this is actually um, a, like a coiled stitch around some of the rattan that I brought um, that Dorothy's doing there. Um, and it's a slow process, this weaving. Um, but I brought up all sorts of bits of lighting um, components for them to have a play with. Um, this is Marilyn. Marilyn was the daughter of Dorothy who was in the previous photo. She disappeared one day um, and she came back so sorry and, and, and you know she was gone for 24 hours in a five-day project and she was um, gambling and the pokies. But she was really sorry, you know, she really was. And, and I, you know, I, I just think it's so great that they were even there, that they were able to turn up and be there and commit to that because of all the stuff that they have to deal with, with their families and their communities. If anyone's been to Catherine, they'll probably know. Um, there's a lot. So we combine techniques, a bit of coiling, a bit of looping, and um, a bit of paired twining, which are all techniques that they use traditionally up there. So I was encouraging them to play and to not be too set on the idea of what a basket is or what a light shade is. There are amazing, you will have seen, some of you maybe, um, Koskela, there's amazing communities working with Elko Island um, Aboriginal people making lights, selling them here in Sydney over a frame, over a light shade frame. And I wanted to not be doing um, something too similar to that. So we were sort of going free form without too much structure. Um, and you can see how beautiful the colours were. And here's one almost finished, which I think is really beautiful. And I know from my own experience that basketry lends itself perfectly to light because of the gaps, so the shadow that comes through. Um, one of the women wanted to play with jewellery, so she brought some wire and she did, I showed her how to do a bit of looping um, and, um, and then we hung their almost finished pieces in the tree, which was great fun. Everyone was terrified of this horse. Um, there was lots of screaming and kind of hilarity when the horse came too close. Um, and then we had a feed of some rune tail, seems to be a theme in my work, um, over a fire with a bit of saxa salt, good stuff. So. Um, we went back to the community on the last day and a lot of people came from the town to have a look. Um, there's something called humbug which is when families come and they sort of hang around and they all share. So they'll say no humbug, no humbug, but humbug is like hey auntie you've got something, can I have some of that, whatever it is. So a lot of family came, a lot of people came around to have a look at what they were doing and then there was a lot of pride. So it's about turning this shame feeling into a pride feeling, a lot of this work. That's mother and daughter there. And the mother is an incredible artist in her right, own right and makes incredible sculpture. Um, so after, you know, just a few days of weaving, we had these fun and beautiful samples. Um, and you can see how happy I am there at the end. <laughs> Purely, probably because I wasn't on my bottom on a tarp anymore. But, um, but also I just felt really proud uh, of being part of this this experience um, and very lucky. That's Dora. Dora! Um, and Dexter. So yeah. Um, so that was uh, one an Australian project. The next project um, was more recent. This was in March last year. I was approached by um, Nicole Penman who is a PhD um, candidate from Queensland University um, who was helping a friend of hers create an online marketplace for Samoan weaving. Um, and they were calling it Susu and Meli, which means milk and honey. And they approached me um, to work with the Samoa Victim Support Group um, and uh, to go over and to try and get some uh, consolidation of the weaving into products that they could sell. So upskilling in business and empowering the women in um, understanding what they needed to do to get these products ready for international markets as opposed to local markets. Um, where is Samoa was my first question and I didn't actually have much idea. I'd been to Fiji once on a family trip um, and then I discovered it's like here, <laughs> right in the middle of the ocean. And it's a tiny island nation with um, two islands with a total population of 200,000 people which is about the size of Hobart. So I travelled over there um, 
after lots of um, consultation with Nicole and Skype phone meetings and things, so I had uh, some understanding of what was going on, but I wanted to go a few days early so I could visit the villages. The project was going to be based in the city, Apia, the capital city, in a hotel, and all the women from the different villages, because uh, it wasn't like the other projects where there was one community, it was individual women from lots of different villages. So they were all going to come to the city for a three-day weaving project um, that I was going to facilitate. But I decided it was a good idea to have a look around before I ran these classes. So I got there a few days early and went for a drive around the island. And this woman was just weaving. And I think one of the passions, uh, the, one of the things that's so magic about having a passion for textiles is that when you tr do travel to other countries, other places, you can seek out that, those villages or those people and go and have a focus for your travel. Um, and you can talk to people about what they're doing and, and witness it in action. So here we just pulled up the car and said, do you mind if we come in and have a look? And here was the pandanus, a different sort of size leaf than I was working with in the territory. And the women, and the woman in this was making an, um, I think an ayitoga, I think is the correct term. Um, the mats are highly significant um, wealth signifiers and gifts between marriage um, uh, and village. So they are the kind of things that would always be given at a ceremony. Um, there's plenty of research on the internet. If anyone's interested in looking up Samoan weaving, you can find lots of information there. Um, so it's a type of plaiting. So me trying to talk to the woman. And I've got an example here. This is the laufala, they call it, um, which is the pandanus. So this is a role that I um, got in through customs. Um, but I, <laughs> I sprayed it all. And I've, I've actually got a fumigator at home that I use who's a, a flick man. But being a basket lover and textile lover, you become pretty good when you're shipping things back and forth and daughter of a farmer. But that's the, the laufala there. And I always declare everything at customs as well and get permission. But, um, but that's one that I just wanted to have the role to, to show, because um, I think they're beautiful just as they are. Um, so these are some of the finished works that the women's brought along. So I asked them to bring three of their best pieces, something that's their favourite, something traditional, whatever they liked. Um, and someone here I saw earlier had some of the beads around their wrist. It was from the Pacific or from the top, you don't... From Queensland, yeah. So they, they really love these, um, this beadwork, but I was there for weaving, so I asked them to put those aside and we focused more on the, um, on the baskets and mats. Um, so here we are in the sort of, in the hotel room. Um, it was about this hot, most of the lots of sweating. Um, and these women were the star weavers of Samoa. So the UN had been running a project for five years um, for Nofotane, um, and they trained 5,000, I think 5,170 Nofotane women um, over two years, and it was funded by the UN Women's Fund for Gender Equality. The reason it's important to train these women is because Nofotane are women who have married outside their home village. Samoa is very traditional, very religious, very village-based, and these women were treated as second-class citizens in their village. They weren't allowed to dress the same as the other women, and they were given a lot of the sort of menial work. Um, so it's an identity that defines their low social stature in the village. And traditionally, um, yeah, they're not often denied any voice in decision-making within their homes and communities. So this project was um, implemented by the Samoa Victim Support Group and improving their access to sustainable employment and increasing participation and leadership within the village decision-making bodies. So the outcome of the project was of 5,170 women was to identify 20, it was not the only outcome, but after, after two years, but they did identify 20 star weavers. So these women were identified as being able to make a living that would be more than what their family could make otherwise through their weaving. So they're good weavers. Um, and many of them were pastors' wives. 
We spent the first day of our three-day project, again, doing a bit of fun weaving activities that I brought along, because I know some good weaving icebreakers, and um, they shared stories. And that, to me, is almost as important as the weaving. They, we went around the circle, one by one, and each woman told us her own personal heartbreaking story. So, uh, lots of singing, lots of tears, and lots of love in the room before we even began making anything. So, but we did have a job to do. So, I had made a bit of a mood board of sort of fashionable, trendy weaving things from Australia. These were young girls starting this project. Um, so, uh, I had some young helpers who were Australian Samoan Christians who were there helping me. Um, and you'll see some of them in the picture, um, Dolores, and, um, and they were translating for me. We had a lot of fun. I brought measuring tapes and I was essentially helping them design a detailed design document for each product. Because as you would know, sometimes you make something and you don't really measure or you don't really plan and you certainly don't take a note or design. Often you do, often I do, often I don't. So um, what we wanted to encourage them to do was to learn that in business, you actually need to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver. So if someone orders, and I know this from my Peruvian experience, if someone orders 50 of something, 10 of them can't be the wrong size, or have different colours, or be too embellished. So I've got these, this folder here, which you can have a look through, and um, I took them design specification sheets and asked them, it's totally, you know, out of their usual comfort zone, to actually do drawings and sketches of what they were going to make and measure uh, with measuring tapes and, talk, and to really define um, each product. So we broke them up into groups. Some people were doing mats, some were doing bags, some were doing hats. And um, we did a lot of discussion. This is one of the, the mats that they made. Um, we talked about how we needed a tie. We talked a lot about what people in Australia might want. You know, if, I, if it was a mum buying this as a baby mat, how might it work? Would these sharp edges be a problem? that sort of thing. So really going through design stuff. Um, and we made five, five decisions, five product groups, um, each with a leader. And, um, and here we have beautiful Nal Pule, who is hilarious. Lots of um, funny dancing she did throughout the day. Suddenly she'd break into dance. And, um, and we really uh, just narrowed down which things people wanted to make, what they were good at, what they enjoyed. And then the aim would be to distribute these design documents to everybody. So if you were in part of the project, you would have all those five designs and you could make what would, needed to be made when the order came in. Um, so you can see there was lots of drawing and sketching and discussion. Um, and yeah, it was really wonderful. Um, and there's a lot of pride again, beautiful smiling happiness. Um, and uh, we, you know, we're looking at how, you know, we had good photographers there. Um, and this intergenerational thing, these are girls who live in Brisbane, they're Samoan, traditional Samoan heritage, and they were just um, having a gorgeous time with the older women and sharing that culture together. Um, Naz Naupule, um, and then again, the children were there. Um, Naupule decided she wanted to love my earrings, so here she is. Um, having my earrings. She went through my whole jewellery bag and chose herself some earrings and in exchange um, for the glitteriest earrings I had, she gave me this dress um, that she was wearing because I was saying how, how much I loved it on the day before she was wearing. So um, that was really fun. And here we are at the end of the project. Um, the final project, so that was Samoa, three days. But, um, just to finish, just to just ongoing for that, I have that was only in March last year. Um, I literally don't know how far they've gone with their creation of the website and their online market. There's there are difficulties with all these projects in ter in terms of the there's a lot of um, familial violence and um, uh, sexual abuse and. Um, on the last day, the Samoan Victim Support Group took me to a children's centre um, where a whole lot of children who've been taken from their families um, to live and to heal um, sang Amazing Grace 
um, in their language and in English and, you know, just, um, just devastating. So I don't think you can say, well, what's happened? Are they selling? Are they, you know, are these products being made? There's a time that, you know, has to go into the furtherance of, of these things. So I'm not tapping my watch saying, you know, I want, I want an update, but I have sent an email saying, you know, how's it going? What's happening? So hopefully something will come of it. Um, the final one is um, something that's still going, ongoing, and I've been part of since 2017, and it's more local to me. And so we're going back full circle to the Riverina, um, close to Young, where I was born, and um, it's a project that was started by the Wired Lab, um, an artist-led organisation evolving interdisciplinary art practices in rural Australia. Um, they started a project that's funded by the Australia Council for the Arts, Create New South Wales and um, local land services to identify and work with Wiradjuri groups and to offer free workshops um, to identify plants that are endemic and native to the region that were traditionally used for basketry and to reintroduce traditional skills. So I was coming together with plant scientists, um, Owen and Alison Whitaker, who have a wealth of knowledge in Australian native plants and seed regeneration, myself as a weaver, um, and a lot of aunties. This is Auntie Cheryl Penrith, um, gorgeous um, Wiradjuri woman, um, and a lot of the women in that region, it's different to the Northern Territory because the culture there was really, dec really decimated, um, and they, a lot of them live without, and a lot of them were taken away to live in, um, uh, uh, to live with, um, what's it, I've forgotten the name, it's terrible, um, to, no, no, not camps, um, to live at Bungle, and missions, sorry, I beg your pardon, to live on missions, and um, so for these women, it's about a complete re-embracing of something that they were not allowed to own. They weren't allowed to speak their language, they were supposed to become white and have white culture. And so working with them was um, really enriching, is really enriching, and I'm still working on the project. Um, it's a three, but, well, three years so far and counting. It'll probably be five years in total and culminating in an exhibition in 2021. And the thing that makes this project different is we're only using um, native and endemic plants that have grown in that area. So a lot of people work with this stuff. These are made by someone on the project, um, which is raffia. A lot of weavers work with raffia, and it's from Madagascar. So um, we are trying to work together to find a way to make their work traditional and local. Um, again, just that sense of joy and reconnection and women working together. This is at Brungle near Tumut. Um, a whole lot of aunties having fun. And um, this woman here, Auntie Sony, is the, the elder from that community centre. And Deb Wood is a woman here who made these earrings. Um, Deb has her own studio now and is teaching a whole lot. And um, she's really taking it on. And through this project, there are some people that have fallen away and come along to one or two workshops. Because they're free, it's sort of harder almost to get people to come, which is funny because if you pay, you're going to turn up. Um, but Deb has become quite a, a wonderful weaver and, and a lot of the women through the project have, um, have really embraced it. So, um, yeah, the project has um, since had workshops in Kudamundra. Here we are in Wagga. Um, yeah, there's um, Mel Evans, who's uh, the, uh, the liaison and artist um, who lives locally, is not a Wiradjuri woman, but is fantastic at helping me with the project. Um, and Auntie Gail Manderson, who's quite a, an expert weaver and has woven a lot, is quite loved by everybody in the area. Um, but getting some of these women to not use the string and raffia and things that they can buy at the store, because it's a lot harder working with leaves that you've harvested. But we've done a lot of weaving on country. I don't have any photos of that. Um, but these are just images of the project and young people working together. That's Deb's piece that she made at the first workshop. Um, in a frame and so gorgeous, and that will be exhibited in 2021 at the Museum of the Riverina. Eve, her granddaughter, who Clementine became quite friendly with when we were down there, um, again, beautiful intergenerational learning. 
Um, so, Emu Feathers, I brought to a lot of projects. I'll finish up soon, but um, Emu Feathers, I brought to a lot of projects. And the last time at Narandra, there was a woman there, Auntie Joy, who um, just freaked out literally could not be in the same room as an emu feather and I've taken them to nearly every workshop that I've done over the last sort of however many years and um, she grew up with a story of the featherfoot which is a spirit um, and the featherfoot was like the bogeyman and the featherfoot would get you if you um, weren't careful so their family was very strong about not being in the same space as emu feathers and it really interesting because other women who are also Wiradjuri would say to me oh, I've never heard that I'm happy to work with emu feathers. So, um, yeah, really interesting sort of this, these things that people learn in the culture of their family that then others don't. So, uh, particularly for this region, it's really, um, really fantastic to be involved with something that is, is uh, a complete re-embracing of culture um, and, um, and helping people really um, get that pride back. Um, that's some courage on coffee. So there's lots that can be done with plants and, and native work. Um, so that's, that's the Indigenous projects that I wanted to talk to you about. You can see there's a, a through line for all of them and, um, and you can see how I feel and why I feel so lucky to have been invited into these communities and, um, and I've just loved working in all of them um, and I hope that I get to do a whole lot more throughout my life in different parts of the world because I'm sure that there are just hundreds of beautiful craft associations out there um, with women that um, are making work of the same quality. So it's just about getting the word out. Um, oh, I've discovered I should speak closer to the microphone. Um, so finally, my work, I then, I think Margie saw this exhibition, just a few pieces of the work that I've been doing. I basically have sort of taken basketry and um, turned my work into more of sculpture um, incorporating found materials, um, things that are burnt, which, you know, there'll be quite a lot of material going around at the moment. Um, you know, burnt out cars, this story of decay and life, of, of, of uh, things um, turning and returning, um, it really appeals to me. Um, so this is the exhibition that Margie saw. I've that was at Sturt, which is a nice full circle for me because that's where I studied basketry with Virginia Kaiser and um, others. Um, and I've since signed with a gallery in Melbourne, so I'm going to be showing with a gallery that has an um, art gallery in Melbourne, Brisbane and the UK. So a new chapter for my work leading more into, um, into making artwork rather than the functional lighting. Um, and yeah, just trying not to get a real job, really, is the, is the end. Um, so I think that's quite enough. Um, I hope you really um, take something from it. I haven't really taught you anything. Um, you were saying all the talks have been very useful. Um, but I encourage you to, to buy fair trade if you can and to obviously think about where your um, uh, gifts come from who they're made by, how long they took to make, um, and also if you do get the chance to travel to try and support the communities um, as you go. Um, I'm taking a group to Laos in October. If anyone does have itchy feet, um, we're going to be working with Op Pop Top, which is a um, traditional silk weaving and dyeing community centre. I'll be teaching some basketry as well, and um, that's with Ace Camps, a Canadian travel company. So come and join me feel like travelling. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. What a wonderful talk that covered such a huge spectrum of issues, not just the basketry, but women and empowerment. Have you come across Anne Kempton from Timeless Textiles in uh, Newcastle? I watched her a bit of her talk. Right. Yeah. Because I think you two would get on well. <laughs> From the sound of it. Do you remember we had Anne coming and talk to us about her gallery in Newcastle and she spent quite a lot of time helping women also, particularly mm. in finding their voice and finding a creative way to earn money to pay bills. But I really appreciate that. I think we've all been riveted and fascinated and it hasn't mattered at all to us that you've talked a long time because you've done such a lot 
and given us a lot to think about. So again, Thanks, thank you very much and I hope um, when we get round to having proper workshops, I hope we can invite you to come and teach us something of the many things that you do. I think a lot of us would be interested in that. Mm -hmm.